If I can get everybody's attention, please. Uh, we're going to call this work session to order. This is uh, Monday, May 9th, uh, 2016 at 4.30 p.m. We're in the Thomas J. Smith Council Chambers. Uh, we'll be uh, rolling right downhill tonight, but we're going to move a couple of things uh, up for those of you that are following. So, uh, uh, first tonight we'll be covering uh, consideration of a development agreement for Apollo School. We have a presentation tonight. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, Pete Speaker with Miller Valentine is currently meeting with Saunders and Heights down in my office. They're just wrapping up. So he's meeting with that neighborhood association. Thought he'd be up in a few minutes. But. Okay, we'll just bypass him for now, and we'll come back to him. How about that? And we'll start with uh, number 12. Uh, this is a resolution approving agreement with Police Facility Design Group uh, PA for the Burlington Police Facility renovation. And uh, uh, Police Chief Beard, are you going to uh, you going to start us off with that? Yeah, just very briefly, <clears throat> kind of what we wanted to put together tonight was just maybe a short question and answer session of maybe anything you had, any questions you'd have for the architect. Mr. Estes has been willing to drive up here from Kansas City this afternoon to spend some time with us. If you have any questions about the process or kind of where we're at. I mean, <clears throat> the building's been purchased, as you know, and so now our next phase of this will be design a concept. And Mr. Estes has helped us throughout this process beginning in 2009 with the needs assessment from the building, and he's been beside us all the way. So he's very familiar with the project and with the bank, and he's presented an agreement to the city of Burlington to be the architect for the project from beginning date to completion and has also has been willing to help us with the process to select a construction manager. We've decided to go with that process and he's been very instrumental as well in helping us navigate our way through that request for qualification. So with that said, does anybody have any questions? I know this agreement is a very in-depth document but it's a standard document put out by AIA. I mean, any document you would see from any architect that would involve a construction manager to assist in a project, you would see this exact same document. I mean, it's been tried and true in the courts all over the countryside. So, I mean, we, we entrust, obviously, in his ability to put this document together. And it is a very standard boilerplate document. But if there's any questions in there, that you have now or you have before next Monday night, feel free to ask. One thing I already addressed with James was it talks about in here the fee to construct or to help us design the firing range. Well, you, you can scratch that. We already know that we can't afford the firing range, and, and Mr. Estes is well aware of that. Those extras in there, if you will, the only way he could proceed with that would be with our permission. So whether, rather than just remove it from the document, he would have to have our permission to proceed with an extra like that. So, and like I said, I'm, I'm confident we don't have the money and unless somebody comes forward with a very large private donation, we're not gonna have the money to continue with that part of the project. So we're all very well aware of that. So with that said, it is, if you, if you look in here at his, his fee or the fee that he's talking about charging is the exact number that he gave us one year ago to do the architect fees for the building. So. I thought that was more than fair of him to do that. Here we are 16 months later, things go up. Well, he hasn't had any, he didn't put any increases in there at all. So is there anything you want to add, Jane? Only, only any questions? Can, can I have, yeah, can we have you come up, please, and the way everybody can hear you. Uh, James Estes with uh, Police Facility Design Group. Uh, as the chief said, we're out of Kansas City. One thing I'll point out, we've been Wilson Estes Police Architects throughout most of this project. We've just recently gone through a renaming of the company. Okay. Same Boy. company. This is based on the study that was initially conducted with the city and county law enforcement. We went back, we looked at alternatives for police only. Uh, then we've looked at the uh, bank facility. Uh, this contract is really based on some of the preliminary work we did in looking at the bank, uh, I think going all the way back to 2000. 2009 or 10 initially uh, we put together some costs on there and and obviously everybody was was uh, looking at the new costs we developed in the study and recognizing that these are expensive buildings and looking at ways to save quite a bit of, of, of money so even as we did the initial look 
on the bank facility. We were looking at, at doing a good police facility, but one that we were trying to do everything we could to limit the budget on the project. For example, we've created some constraints in the design of the project in that our intent is to reuse stairwells and reuse restrooms wherever we can. Those were some of the ways we kept our cost down. That is still our intent to move forward along that line. So this scope of services is a comprehensive scope of service that gets you from reviewing the work that we did several years ago, the design work on the project, the construction documents that a contractor can bid the building from, and acting as your representative, your liaison, looking at your interest to make sure the contractor constructs the building in accordance with the plans that we come up with as we work through with the department on this. Uh, it's, it's, it's in essence, it's turnkey from the standpoint of the architectural services work. It is also based on a construction administration contract uh, using construction management as the delivery method, which is where the contractor is kind of engaged with us throughout the process, so we will be working closely with them. I think it uh, represents the intent of the department as we have developed it from the study, and it should carry you all the way through completion of the project. Some of the big unknowns, I think, are we developed uh, the budget for this a fair amount of time ago. Costs, fortunately, have stayed relatively flat since almost 2008, but they have been going up some recently. Uh, I, I think one of the things we'll do very early on is look at the existing program, any little revisions to that, but we'll also be looking at the budget to make sure that uh, you know we're, we're still able to do all of the things, or if nothing else, we'll look at the budget we have and make sure that everything, we may have to make some revisions in program to stay within the budget. Those are, those are some of the initial discussions that we will have. So with, with that said, it is a fairly standard uh, contract using AIA documents. They're pretty well time tested. Uh, even most of the things that get changed in contracts, I put them in pretty much in, in accordance with the changes that most uh, city legal departments like to make in the contracts. Uh, we've got in place, you know, our insurance requirements, they're stated in there, the fees, uh, and the entire working relationship. With that said, if there's any other questions, I'd be happy happy to address them. What's your timetable? How do you see this working out time-wise? Well, uh, yeah, I, I think our, what we're really doing is working backwards from the time that the city can actually occupy the bank building. And, and um, I think right now that's looking summer. A rural base OT. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so we back up from there to give ourselves a a one a one month window for contractors to kind of get under contract and get mobilized ready to start we go another month back from there to a bid date so we're shooting for a bid date about two months before the bank would be turned over to the city for actual uh, possession and, and starting <clears throat> construction work aside from that we're probably looking at about a six month uh, time frame in terms of doing the architectural services to get us up to the point of bidding. So we're getting close to the point where uh, we'd, we'd wanna e engage the department in the review of the existing work, what's been done in the past, make sure everything is still on track, and then we'd start doing the initial conceptual design work. Uh, so from, from that start up with them of review to the date we're ready to put the drawings out on the street for bid, including all the all the work we're going to be doing with the construction manager to make sure we're staying within the budget uh, is, is probably about a six month window. I mean, you know, we can, we can speed things up, but we like to make sure that the feedback we're getting from the department and from the city in general uh, is not rushing all of you to make decisions. So um, that sounds reasonable. Yeah, you're talking about a, about an eight month time from the date we can occupy the building so we're we're getting we're closing in on that good thank you so uh, you mentioned the word budget a number of times and uh, as a council we we're really cognizant of that mm -hmm. fact and I know chief is too it, it's really really crucial I know it's way too early for you to say that you can do it but uh, we did kind of guarantee the public that we were going to stay within a number and so yeah. that's really crucial to us yeah. and, and ultimately we put the initial numbers together 
And we did it with certain assumptions about the bank building, such as we want to use as much as the mechanical right. system as we can. At the same time, we know this is going to be a 24-7 critical use building, and so we know that we're going to make modifications to the heating cooling system. We know a little bit about the power requirements, but until we really get in to depth on the looking at that with our engineers, uh, you know, we're not going to know precisely. When we developed the numbers for this, everything we were doing was looking at not 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 what you would call doing it on the cheap, but trying to be uh, conscientious with the dollar right. spent. Right. We want to continue in that path. Our goal is this, and I think anytime you 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 conduct a bond referendum and the, the public's involved in the numbers, uh, you're establishing that as as the budget the budget uh, that we have to hit. We, what we will do is, is within that initial estimate we put together, work in that direction. If we find we're pushing up against the budget, what we'll be doing is going back to the department to look for ways to prioritize what's going into the project and control what goes into it to stay within that budget. Yeah. Now, if it comes down to certain things that they really feel that need to be kept in there and, it's, and we're having trouble working working with it within that budget will probably come back to you not not necessarily to try to increase the the amount but maybe to look at exactly what dollars are available uh the the bond referendum was run in no, november um, we have a pretty good idea of what the bond referendum what it was run on but sometimes you know the different pots of money that that uh, are, are set up within our budget. We're, we'll be looking at how much is for bricks and mortar, and, and how much is for furnishing and furnishings. And you know, we may we may have to make some decisions about it, how we stay within the budget. It's it's all a management process, yeah. and the construction manager, uh, with their construction background experience, will obviously be a, a, a powerful ally to us in that process. And the same with all of you. We will. We will not just plow ahead when we make decisions about what goes into the project and, and maintaining the budget, uh, the department and the city will be involved in, in those issues as we go through it. I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. I, I think the uh, uh, part of the, the reason why I think we, we got the overwhelming vote was because we assured the citizens that we were going to be responsible in the spending and, and I think they deserve to see that process. Uh, play itself uh, play itself out all the way through and I'm I'm glad to hear you say what you're saying to us yeah. I already know that we have the commitment from the uh, from the police chief and from the police department that we're not trying to uh, uh, to uh, build a champagne building on, mm -hmm. a, on a beer budget mm -hmm. so uh, but at the same time we don't want a subpar building either so right. I think right. I think we're on right on the same page yeah. I, yes. I feel real satisfied with that you three covered it well. Yeah. <laughs> My fault exactly. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for coming. Thank, thank you, you, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Okay. Um, since you made it back up with us now, uh, can we get you to come on up and talk to us about uh, the Apollo building, please? Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for your time again. Welcome. Pete Schwigerot with Miller Valentine Group, 9349 Water Symbol of Art, Cincinnati. Well, since we last met, we've uh, been working to put together a, a, a more formal proposal. What you have in front of you is really just a two-page, two what I'll call letter of intent uh, that really just kind of summarizes the boy bullet points to, to how we could potentially acquire the building and convert it into housing. Um, as discussed, our, our really our plan is, um, as it was last time, there are some, some minor changes as we looked into the building further. We had at one point talked about it might take multiple phases to actually develop the building fully. Um, the reality is I think we, we've come to the conclusion we can probably d get the building converted in one phase. Um, what, let's see if I can, let's 
going. It's just slow. slow. Okay. Um, really not much changes. And my pre presentation hasn't changed much as either. Oh, one reason I'm going to flip through a few slides is I w did get the opportunity to meet with a, a local neighborhood association uh, to, to present and, and present basically the same story I presented to you last time wanting to get their input and feedback. Hopefully they were all, they all seemed, I think, I won't speak for them, but I think excited and interested in our development. I think we answered any concerns and questions that they have. Um, where I think I, I'm gonna just go, if you can, can you just thumb to the last slide? Yeah. It's basically a, a, a new schedule. Um, and so I, I guess I wanted to present what our schedule would be. So here we are with a proposal that we would enter into a purchase agreement based on the terms in front of you. Um, that would be the first step. So now that we have, in theory, site control, which would we would hopefully secure over the next month or so, ideally by the end of June, we would have that site control secured, where we would have a purchase agreement to purchase the building with certain contingency inspection periods and process that we have to go through. The, the reality is, though, is there are many, many steps that we have to go through. It's not just go to IFA like it was last year with the Salter School. Before we can get to the housing tax credits, there are several other sources of funds that we need to line up and other processes we have to go through. So my goal is, is to present a, a schedule for you of how that we could, we could do this. In theory, like I said, over by the, by the end of June, we would hopefully be entering to a purchase agreement where we would have site control. From there, we would go through two processes um, over the summertime. So starting in June, number one, we would pursue uh, a historic designation. Um, that goes ultimately to the National Park Service federally, but it starts here with your SHPO office and your state historic process. So we cannot do what we want to do without a historic designation and the historic tax credits that come along with that. The historic designation is to score points in the tax credit, uh, the housing tax credit application as well as the fact that it gives us 20% tax credits to help finance the project. Is it the, is it the historic uh, designation credits that give you the, that put you over the top for the ones that you're meant for the? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the scoring. I think it's um, 10 points for historic. The category we lost from last year was eight points. So we should end up a little bit ahead, netting ahead a little bit. Um, and so that process, we need to get started in June because we need to hear, yes, you got the designation before we can even go into the housing credit process because you have to have what's called a historic part one by the time you make application. So that's the step, first step in the process. The other steps we have to do is to go to the Iowa Economic Development Authority and they have three sources. They have what's called a workforce credit, a brownfield credit, and a grayfield credit. We think we're eligible for at least two of those, possibly three of those. We need to secure those in advance of the tax credit application. So we'll go through two processes over the summer, the historic process and then the process with Iowa Economic Development Authority to secure what we'll call the secondary or gap financing sources. With all of that in place, by the end of the summer, early fall, we, if we can check those boxes, we can then say, okay, let's go on to the housing credit application, which would be applied just like last year in December uh, and we find out in March. So, um, and we would structure this all into the purchase agreement. We wouldn't have a purchase, because as you can tell, this is gonna take through the end of 17 before we would actually be able to purchase the building. The way we've got the contract built is certainly once we get to certain hurdles, certain non-refundables, might, money might go hard, uh, but it's hard for us to put big money up front to begin, because we're gonna spend tens of thousands of dollars just going through a historic process, going through um, these work for the Economic Development Authority process. So we're gonna have a lot of investment in on a project that isn't really there yet. Um, so that's why you see a lot, of, a, long, a long period to get through that, because ultimately we gotta m apply for multiple sources, secure multiple sources, and even then once we've secured the sources, go through all sorts of in, uh, due diligence that includes environmental cleanup, the construction, the design, the architecture, the engineering. Um, so long story short, uh, if we can get through all that process, we would be acquiring the building ideally um, late 2017. Um, it would be about a 15-month build. 
uh, we're not at this point anticipating any demolition of the building or any building additions, just using the existing building, converting it into housing historically, uh, likely to develop about, in this case, 55 units is our new number. Um, it would include market rate and tax credit units um, and uh, would really be open to all. So it could certainly cater to seniors as well, but it would be open to a young family or a single, a young professional, really accommodating and really we should have a, re a, a unit available for anyone in your community by the time said and done. Is that, um, the same, is that the same deal on the, uh, uh, the uh, rent stays the same as long as, as, long as they uh, yeah. stay there? Yeah, they'll be paying their own rent. We do offer a discounted rent as part of the affordability of the tax credits. Most of the units will target 60% AMI, just like we talked about last time, 60% adjusted median income. 10% of the units or more will be market units that anyone can rent at, at any income. Um, so with this, um, I think we're hoping you would potentially engage your formal process to potentially enter into an agreement with us. I think that would start hopefully with a purchase agreement and then also a development agreement that would probably partner that, that would stipulate some of the other local resources that we're going to need, the incentives. Um, in order to make this project feasible, I will say from day one is, and I think I've mentioned this in the last one, it will be imperative for us to have a 15-year TIF rebate. Um, that is really important to the economics of this project and to our scoring. I think you're familiar with the whole concept of 7% of development cost. 15-year rebate might technically equate to slightly more than 7%, but it's very important to the pro forma because it will keep the taxes off the pro forma through the modeled life of the development. And from the lender investor standpoint, that's a very important feature. So um, our request would be to purchase the building at the noted price, uh, giving us the time frames uh, noted in the contract to get through all those processes um, and then also help us by delivering the requested incentives and ultimately ending with 55 brand new high quality affordable units done to historic standards green design energy efficient 100 percent accessible um, should total around 11 million dollars in, in the new building what about management? Do you have a manager on site? Yeah, well, uh, there will be a full-time on-site manager. So they'll, they'll have their own office in there. Um, uh, and then we'll also have a full-time maintenance service person. Okay. <clears throat> That's important. Bottom line is we should know early in 2017 whether you've qualified and whether we can move forward with the project. Yeah, there's probably a couple steps. So um, if we get through the historic and the workforce credits, the economic development authority's processes, and for some reason one of those doesn't come through, we'll cut bait early. It's not like we then say, oh, we're going to keep this under contract for another year. Yeah. And we can write that into the purchase agreement that if you don't get these, then the contract would terminate because we we unfortunately just couldn't move it forward at that point. So yeah, I guess that would be my preference, but that's just me. Yeah, see what yeah. I would. Mm -hmm. You guys good? Yep. All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you. So, and just if I may, I guess in theory, uh, next steps would be how would we potentially, just so that I can be prepared to <laughs> provide additional information or be back in front of you to more formalize or? I guess. Part of that, we're working with our bonding attorney. This, uh, we will have to do an urban renewal plan amendment. Uh, the previous plan amendment was for the um, demolition of the building to do a TIF rebate. We have to do a plan amendment um, and then have a hearing on disposal of, the, uh, disposal of the property. He did say we could have a resolution expressing intent to proceed immediately uh, with you um, and then work through that process just so that you're assured right. we're going through with you and then go through our plan amendment process and then sale process, which does take some time, but um, those are the kind of the steps that we need to go through. And part of that is your willingness or ability to do that, the requested 15 year uh, TIF rebate, because that's part of the amendment process. Um, so we need some conversation of, do we go forward with that? And that's something Pete needs to know as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I will mention just to try and prevent processes um, for you until we get certain steps on the road. From our perspective, you could put off that urban renewal amendment mm -hmm. until we got to the funding, as long as you are aware and knowing that 
you're willing to commit that amount, the 15 years, and that you'll be willing to make those urban renewal amendments at the future time. So the last thing I'd want to do is for you to do it now, yeah. and then for us to go through this, and for some reason one of these sources doesn't come through, and now you made an amendment for no reason. Right. So the form, the form 5S or whatever mm -hmm. um, wouldn't require the urban renewal to be amended yet, but if you sign the 5S and say you're going to do that at some point, we would need to amend it. Yeah. So that's something we can get from Bob Justin, our bonding attorney, on time frames, and then come back before you and talk to Pete on what those time frames are. And, and then the, in the meantime, that resolution expressing intent to yeah. work with Pete would go. probably be the that would the that would get us started. And then yeah, oh, okay. so we're we're on this June sixth date. Is that what you're saying, Eric? Yeah, I can talk to Jim a little bit more when he gets back. That okay. potentially could be the the June sixth date. Then. Yeah, and if if it, 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 and I don't know that that June sixth date was so specific. If if we get something to the point where we can start moving in June, we should probably be in decent shape. Okay. Sounds good. Any other questions? Thanks for your time. Oh, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, sure thanks for, so that was, that was thanks just for the Sanderson Heights folks, too. Thank you. No kidding. That was Jim's comments that he emailed and just your willingness to go forward with that 15 year abatement. Want to make sure that, don't have to make a decision tonight, obviously, but right. that we're willing to go forward with that. So. Is that, is that Mr. Anderson? Yeah, is that his right. name? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Anderson. Right, good, good to see you tonight. Good to see you tonight. Okay. Uh, we're going to keep rolling. Next, we have uh, the uh, number four uh, public hearing consideration of plans and specifications of the 2016 Cascade Watershed Sewer Separation Project, Phase Two. Brian. Looks like. That computers down. <laughs> um, okay, so this project would be the next phase in the sewer separation for Cascade Basin. Uh, Cascade Basin is basically Harrison Street South uh, in town. This project is addressing a few smaller uh, locations within that area. We've already done one project. Uh, there's, we have six, I believe, locations that are uh, smaller one, two, four intake locations that will be installing new storm sewers to separate the storm off of the sanitary. Um, those locations are on Barrett between Liebrick and Garfield, uh, the Windsor Circle area, Crestview, uh, 16th Street. Oh, here we go, maybe. That's my new line. I'm just going to start playing with her for a minute. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Oh, careful. She's got permission. <laughs> that's even wacky. I was always told you blame the person that's not here. What, what's that? I was always told you blame the person that's not oh, here. That's true. You know what, Ryan? You're a smart guy. <laughs> I need to listen to you more. It was Larry Williams' fault. <laughs> oh, he's here. My fault. Yeah. <laughs> straighten up of where the, these locations are. Do you have it printed out at all? I don't, actually. Okay. Here we go. There we go. If we're lucky. Looks like a map there. Okay. Here we go. Um, these are the various locations where we'd be addressing uh, those intakes. Uh, there's one on Barrett, a uh, couple of existing, it's actually sanitary manholes that are just uh, graded lids or have five holes in the lid that drain the area in Windsor Circle. We'd be installing a few intakes in that area, continuing that out, uh, discharging into the detention pond northeast of the airport. Uh, it's the intersection of 16th and Barrett, not Barrett, sorry, uh, Dunham. Carrying that down through 
um, down 16th and through an existing easement on to uh, the trunk sewer at 14th. A um, little bit on 10th Street, a couple intakes there. The southeast corner of Crestview got a couple intakes there that tie into uh, our sanitary sewer. And then an intake on uh, Concord near the intersection of 3rd. Uh, like I said, cleaning up smaller areas. I will be back in, I would say, a month and a half probably, uh, dealing with some other intakes on Dunham. Uh, it's more of a trunk line, uh, less uh, spread throughout the city. Um, this project will require uh, the acquisition of a few easements. Uh, it's actually more clarification of existing easements. Uh, we've got sanitary sewers throughout town running through private property with easements that are either difficult to find or non-existent. Uh, we'd be clarifying those easements as a part of this project as well. Uh, next week I should have a cost estimate for you. Um, funding should be through the Cascade sewer uh, budget which has been utilized for uh, MASL as well due to that project coming up first. Last I knew I believe we had 2.3 million in it minus what was done for MASL. Uh, our intent would be to receive bids around June 1st uh, and then construction would be this summer. Any questions from the council? Couldn't have got us a cheaper bid, Ryan? <laughs> Don't have any yet. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I've got no reason to shake my head yet, huh? Generally the answer is no, though. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. All right, next we have a uh, public hearing consideration of budget amendment number one for FY 2015-2016 budget. Okay, in your packet, um, it showed um, the budget document that was um, published in the paper that was published last week, um, at least the, the time frame we need to publish before the public hearing next week. So basically, um, I created a work paper, Eric is gonna bring it up, if we can get to it, uh, just showing the reasons why we're a amending some of the budget. Um, so I'll just quickly kind of go through. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, this is for the, f the fiscal year we're in right now. That will end June 30th, 2016. And um, we are increasing for revenues, um, road use. That was, um, we budgeted last year before we knew we were going to have the fuel tax. Um, you'll see there's quite a few for targeted jobs. Um, those two are, um, at the time we budgeted last year, not sure exactly what that, the monies that we would bring in. And those are ins and outs. We bring the money in and then we turn around and cut the checks back to the, the entities. Um, I'm, I also budgeted in the million dollars that we received um, for the Newberry Village that wasn't planned. Um, we anticipate we're going to get about 450000 in local option sales tax, more than we budgeted. Um, about 80,000 in hotel motel um, and then the bond proceeds for 2016 B that's the refunding bond so we budgeted for our capital projects bond but again refunding that's always a year-to-year -year look at what makes sense to refund and refinance so and then we we would like to increase the transfers just because we've got a lot of going in and out with the police building um, you know we receded that um, Newberry Village CBG money, um, and then we'll be transferring it to another fund, um, TIF transfers, um, road use transfers, and lost, just different ways we're transferring money. So on the expenditure side, um, we are increasing um, public safety. Um, we've, we, we're over on fire over time. We also, um, for police, we had um, training and physicals for four new officers, and that's, um, because we have the COPS grant, so we are hiring more than what we actually had budgeted. Um, road use, you know, we've had different projects come out. You've seen the lights out on Roosevelt that have been needing repair, so um, that's where a lot of that expense is coming from for the lights, buying the LED lights and also installing them and repairing them. Um, the comp study wasn't budgeted. We're increasing that. Um, professional fees, that's our attorney fees, are a little bit higher than what we budgeted. Um, also, again, we're on the expense side, we're um, budgeting for that refunding amount. Um, we actually um, 
called that bond, the 2008 bond, back in August, if you remember that, and paid that. That's where Federal Mogul was paying their yeah. um, targeted jobs. So that wasn't budgeted in this fiscal year. And then the other part is the $2.3 million for the refunding bond we're doing. Um, again, culture and rec, those are um, you know expense expenditures um, for the hotel motel monies and auditorium. And the way we're not technically going to be spending more on the auditorium. It's just how we record the um, expenses from venue works and put them in our books. So since they're having more activity, they'll have more expenses um, than what we originally budgeted. So we just like to, to put in an estimate. Um, Does some of that have that. to do with the fact that our that we don't have our, our city guys doing most of the stuff now? Is that is that some of that? Or? No, it, I, I just think this year they're having more activities down there. Oh, it's just strictly. Yeah, okay. yeah. So we'll, the you know, the just revenue will be, you know, again, bottom line is we're not going to have to pay more money for our auditorium, but on the expense side, we have to record all their expenses and all their revenues gotcha. in our books. So just to, the way they're trending, it, it's a little bit higher than what we had budgeted. Um, we in economic or sorry community and economic development we paid off the waterworks tiff debt that we had owed them and that was about two hundred twenty five thousand. you'll see all the targeted job amounts again um, then that's you know revenue coming in and expenses coming out um, and then on the capital project side we did we we are increasing um, some expenditures we received some public safety grants on the fire side that we didn't have budgeted also um, for the purchase of the bank building on Friday, um, we had budgeted we were going to spend seven hundred thousand dollars to rehab the current building. Well, that of course has changed. So, I increased the budget by half a million to get up to that one point two million that we paid for the building on Friday. Um, and then, uh, parking lot ramp wasn't in the budget. Flood projects, those of course weren't in the budget. Those were that was the flood from last summer that right. fell into this fiscal year. And then on the business type, we had a few. Um, projects uh the sewer project was that daf controls that was budgeted in a different year so and then the packer truck on solid waste too that was budgeted in 15 but we're actually purchasing it now and then waterworks um again waterworks burlington municipal waterworks budget is in our budget so we looked at their expenses and um, from what we had budgeted we're increasing that four hundred thousand. so and then transfers i do the same expense transfers as I do revenue transfers they need to be even so a lot more than you wanted so the, bottom line. <laughs> the bottom line is there's um, the revenues are offsetting the the expenses that we're increasing so okay Thank you yeah <laughs> you guys any, have any, other, question? any questions for staff nope. any other information you might want for next week or is this Okay. Well, if, if something comes up, let me know and okay. we'll get it for the public hearing. Thank you. That's Thank as you. good a detail as I've ever seen. I was oh, just okay. to say, good job, Steph. Good job. Okay. Uh, next, we have a public hearing. A consideration of an ordinance vacating and selling a portion of Summer Street right of way located east of the property of 215 Summer Street, Burlington, Iowa, through the first reading. Tisman? Show a map here. Uh, at a request from the property owner 215 summer which is directly south of the walgreens on central and division uh, they're at the dead end of uh, summer street as it goes towards walgreens uh, and they've been looking for ways to build a garage for the last couple of years they'd applied for a variance before and um, i guess came to the request of uh, asking for a portion to be vacated there are no utilities in that right away uh, there is a monitoring uh, station on city property. The city owns this triangle to the east of the lot as well, and um, just did desire to maintain at least five feet off of that property line uh, for city uh, for city property. Um, Planning Commission did hold a public hearing on April 19th and voted six to zero to recommend approval uh, based on the status as a dead end roadway that only serves the property at 215 Summer Street. Uh, the lack of ability for future travel way access through the right of way. Uh, along with desire for ownership and maintenance of the right-of-way by the applicant. Um, also, the utilities come uh, east and west through, uh, I guess, the Aetna right-of-way over to Summer Streets. There's no utilities that go through this as well. Um, so this portion, uh, uh, 54 feet by 25 feet, would be uh, vacated and sold to the property at 215 Summer and attached to their property. 
Any questions on that? I'm fine with it. Council? It's a road to nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> One of many. <laughs> I'm fine with it. You guys good? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, let's just roll right along. Next is a consideration of an ordinance vacating and selling a portion of South 14th Street right away, located west of the property at 1412 Hillary Avenue, Burlington, Iowa. It's a first reading as well. So now, we always get the unusual requests. This one, um, yeah, at 1412 Hillary, there's a, I guess, unusual right away here as well, uh, where it juts in. Um, for the property at 1412 uh, Hillary, uh, and then comes out for the property along Linwood uh, to the north. And they had requested uh, to vacate a portion of this right away to, in order to build a larger garage or shed on the property. Um, upon review, it was found that there is an existing shed on the city right away currently uh, and a portion of fence. Um, do not have any utilities in the 12 feet portion, uh, which would allow their existing shed and fence to be on private property, um, but it's not vacating as much as they would desire just based on the utilities that are uh, within the right-of-way. Uh, the Planning Commission again met on April 19th and they voted 0-6 to six to approve vacating the described right-of-way um, based on the status that they were currently not complying with city code. They currently had existing structures on the right-of-way so they didn't want to, uh, I guess part of the uh, basis was they didn't want to vacate just to correct the issue. Um, even though it would correct the issue, they, they didn't feel that it was proper to vacate since it was already uh, had structures on the right of way. Um, so if it does not go forward uh, through the process or approved by council, the existing structures would be required to be removed from the right of way. Um, and then if based on the review uh, of the request, a maximum of 12 feet is all that could be vacated in order to keep existing utilities within the right of way. Um, so the Planning Commission had concerns that there already was a structure on the right of way and didn't feel vacating based on that was appropriate, um, but it would allow those structures to be brought on to their private property if it were vacated. And it's not vacating as much as he had desired because it's just going to that 12 feet, but that's all that we felt was appropriate based on the utilities in the right of way. Council? Do we have any use for that property? No. Yeah, I, I, I don't understand what's going on here because I, I was uh, we walked by there a lot and I, and I went just the other day I went there. Why is there such a big right of way there? It looks like originally that lined up with the South 14th Street right away to the south. This line does. Okay. Now oh, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, there's multiple subdivisions. Each corner is probably a different subdivision, and the roads came in at different times. And uh, this, actually, this southern portion might have been platted with this. And then when this northern portion, sorry, I'm zoomed in. That makes sense. So if these were all platted together, the right of way lined up, but then this northern one lined up with the north roadway, and it just created this one lot that was off centered. And there happens to be some utility lines that kind of angle in this area. So I'm trying to understand why we should deny this. It's like the, the, uh, the 12 feet, there doesn't seem to be the reason other than there's existing structures there, so but we like want them to conform anyway. A punitive, like you built there, you're not yeah. going to get what you want. Yeah. That doesn't make sense to me. Hmm. I guess I can kind yeah. of understand at least the point of view because it's like it's easier to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. That's kind of how I feel, but I mean, we don't have a use for it, and I get it though, <laughs> considering they're already. I, I'm, I'm only guessing that the person is is uh, innocent; that they didn't realize that they, uh, after taking care of that property for the years that they've lived there, that the where the property line was, okay. and they wanted to increase the size of their garage, and to get that, they had to get a permit and that's when they found out that they were on city right of way mm -hmm. rather than on their property. So I, 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 uh, I understand what you're saying, but I right. really don't think that was the case. I don't know, I haven't talked to people, I'm only guessing that that's... Yeah. No, I mean, that makes sense some, too, because... some innocence uh, uh, there that they 
and I, I'm siding with the side of the um, uh, of the citizen at this point that that be the case because I've I've seen it happen before. And it's usually and if we my don't have a use for it. I I don't see it as being a huge issue. It's usually my stated position. I don't like to go against what the plan commission recommends, but I, I just don't understand this. Why? Why it's and sheds under 150 square feet, we don't require a permit, so he wouldn't, for the existing shed, probably wouldn't have contacted us and until about eight years ago, we didn't require fence permits. So there's, and if you look at the property to the north, you, I could see where you'd naturally think, yeah. why do I have a 40 foot right away right. when everyone else has yeah. 12 or 15? Bob Fleming, give us wisdom. <laughs> Amen, brother. <laughs> Sounds good to me. We all have. Uh, I don't know. We've got some time to think about it and to get our questions answered. So uh, well, it has to go three readings, right? That's right. Okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and move along. Uh, uh, number eight. We're at a resolution approving a loan agreement authorizing. Uh, a uh, I'm sorry. Issuance of a one million two hundred ninety-five thousand dollar general obligation corporate purpose bond series two thousand sixteen A and providing for the levy of taxes. City manager. <laughs> this is just another step in the process of selling those bonds is approving these resolutions. So nothing's changed from what Travis presented before. Um, the 1.2 million, um, 95,000, that's to do the capital projects for um, FY17 that have been budgeted and approved. And then the 2016 bond is the refunding that we're gonna go through with to save the money on interest. Money, yeah. mm -hmm. Yep. Do you guys have any, any <clears throat> questions on that? No. Okay. Gone over it a number of times. Yeah. Amen. Okay, let's move right to number 10. Uh, a resolution approving audit services for fiscal years 2013 through 2015 with McGladry LLP. So that title is wrong. <laughs> that was the resolution from back in um, 2013. So we'll get that corrected. Okay. Um, but in the packet, you'll see our the audit committee, um, we went out, I'll start uh, over. We went out for RFP for our audit services. Um, we wanted to get a three-year um, bid with a two-year optional. Um, so if you look in the packet, Exhibit B shows um, the, the three aud audit firms that were mailed out RFPs um, when they were returned and then what their bids were. And then the audit committee met on Thursday to look over the bids. Um, the low bid was Anderson Larkin and Company. They're out of Ottumwa. They do the City of Ottumwa's audit. They also have a GFA report and get the certification. And they've had it for 22 years. So the audit committee is recommending that we award um, our business to um, Anderson Larkin and Company. We'll save at least $5,000 a year from McGladry, who we currently have now. They were the next lowest bid. So I will get that resolution changed if we're all in agreement tonight that we're fine with going with the lower bid here. Um, we'll do a contract through um, for the next five years for Anderson, so. And did I remember correctly, McGladry had an extra charge involved with the- They did have an extra charge this others, year. Municipal fire and police. Municipal fire, yeah. yeah. So I would, we won't have that with Anderson either. Right. Okay. So. Awesome. You guys good? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, next, we have a res resolution approving the final plat of Burlington Crossing Subdivision. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. Thank you, all zero of you, but thanks anyways. <laughs> the okay. money is in the bank as of Friday afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks, God. Excellent. Does anybody have anything they want to say about that besides... Uh, all right. It's just deal. part of this. Is the final plat is seven lots uh, with the roadway uh, legacy drive. There is an improvement agreement as part of this. Uh, right now, the um, letter of credit isn't filled in. We should get that this week. For that's a credit for the public infrastructure since they're platting before that's the roadway's all in. Um, but they do plan to have that uh, starting construction here this summer and hopefully done this fall. Yep. So that. That number will be put in there once we get that from the yeah. bank. But again, platting seven lots um, with a public roadway connecting agency to market. And probably we'll see future subdivisions as they sell lots, uh, possibly splitting up some of the lots into smaller lots down the road. But uh, right now, seven lots with a couple out lots for stormwater and then a, a lot for Legacy Drive connecting agency down to um, Market Street. 
Excellent. I just want to read these, these two one more time. Number 11, resolution approving the final plat of Burlington Crossing subdivision. And number 12, a resolution approving agreement with Police Facility Design Group, PA, for the Burlington Police Facility renovation. I'm out of here. I'm going <laughs> to leave on a high note. <laughs> I'm going to go actually touch up my water. Could you uh, go ahead and move this forward? Is that awesome or what? Give me a high five. <laughs> Timmy? Okay. Mayor Pro Tour, that's what I'm talking about. You're really mad. No, I'm just getting some water, but I'm jacked up about that. <laughs> Okay, on the, on the consent agenda, we have a resolution approving an agreement with BNSF for Angular, <coughs> excuse me, Angular Street sewer and depot drainage issues. Wow. <coughs> Very Steve. This resolution is bringing uh, kind of to an end, kind of a long standing huh. issue that we've had ongoing. Uh, I know since I was here, we started discussions with uh, BNSF clear back in October of 2013. Uh, making them aware of the problem. The problem from the city's point of view is the fact that uh, there really has been lack of drainage in the depot area and from our point of view that's happened when the when the railroad came in and raised the tracks and it's our belief that they cut off the storm sewer that allowed the water to drain out of that area down to the Angular Street sewer. So we started some discussions making them aware that like I said in, in 2013. In uh, 2014 in the fall there were some problems observed with the Angular Street sewer uh, to the point that the top of the arch was starting to have stones and, and ballast come through. Um, engineering put plans and specs together this next spring uh, of, uh, in June of 2015 to make those repairs. When BNS took a look at it, they felt that those designs were not up to their E80 track standards, so they came in and made the improvements on their own. Subsequent to that, uh, <clears throat> I guess I personally felt this was a point to say when they made those repairs they felt it was our responsibility to take care of the sewer and they were wanting some reimbursement for that so felt it was a good point in time to say we're not really prepared to give you any money until you fix our other problem <clears throat> so we've uh, been kind of going back and forth last year uh, in the summer and fall BNSF did take a look to try to see what it could take to correct those problems and really, we, we didn't really come to a resolution, but we did have a meeting in, in, in March 8th of this year where we all sat down together with BNSF. And essentially what you see as a result of that is, is this agreement that you'd be approving. And it's doing several things. Uh, we've discovered through this process that we can put in our own sewer and drain it back to the north into the Market Street sewer. So that's the first aspect, and we're gonna do that at our own cost. The, uh, as part of this, uh, BNSS, BNSF have agreed not to ask for any reimbursement for the repairs of the work they did to the Angular Street sewer. Um, another part of this agreement is that annually both parties will inspect the Angular Street sewer to see if there's any issues ongoing. And the fourth part of it is uh, in 100, within 180 days of signing this, we need to, both parties need to sit down and come to a resolution to uh, uh, confirming the ownership and ongoing maintenance of the Angular Street sewer. So. Uh, as staff, we recommend you approve this. Uh, the plans and specifications for that sewer, uh, Ryan has not had time in the engineering group. Expect that to be done sometime later, hopefully so it can be out to bid later this fall. I don't know, just one other little thing. We have had a lot of water in the basement. We have got a temporary pump system. It's not had a lot of rain. If you've driven by the depot, you'll see kind of a blue tube coming out of there uh, with wood on each side. So that has kind of enabled construction to go on without a lot of ongoing pumping the water down once it gets built back up underneath the uh, depot. Since you mentioned that construction, how, how's it going? What's happening there? Are they it's moving right along. I mean, they're working on the electrical. We've had several change orders. Um, one, the, the electric, one of the change orders uh, had to do with uh, the electrical. They were hoping to pull a lot of wires through the existing conduit. They've not been able to do that. The old wire had fused at some point and they were not able to get it through. Uh, we've had to have a change order to, uh, essentially they were gonna reuse the old furnace that was there heating the curtain, the, uh, what was the old ticket booth and the waiting area that was closed off. 
we found a lot of issues with that, so we made a decision to put in a, a new furnace. I think that's like 2,500 bucks. The electrical, uh, we've had to put some structural support for the, the, the roof design after they got everything opened. Uh, there are concrete beams in there, and to put the rooftop unit on the top there, top, there had to be a little additional structural support. I'm trying to think. We just, just signed another little change order again today. Some, some electrical repairs, but I think right now we're at about 15,000 of change orders. We had, I think, about 35,000. When we put the budget together, there was like 35,000, somewhere in that range, plus or minus, to... Mm to allow for contingencies. So we are eating away at it, but so far we're in good shape. But the, the work's steadily coming along. Uh, we've got a revised schedule. I don't think it'll be done until probably sometime, probably August at least, that'll be the earliest. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Everybody else is good? Good. Groovy. Okay, uh, next we have a resolution awarding contract for the 2016 wastewater treatment uh, facility S&D building uh, roof replacement, right? Should really let Don take this since he. Let's let Don take this. Since I've already told him that I'd take care of it. Don just put pointed him on the spot. <laughs> Don just pointed uh, at you, so. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> so this is projects for the replacement of three ballasted mm -hmm. roofs at the wastewater treatment plant with unballasted uh, EPDM roofs. Um, it's. In the current budget to replace the roof of the S and D uh, building down at the wastewater treatment plant, S and D solid and disinfection if you care. Uh, two other roofs were coming up in the next couple of years that are going to need replaced, and the budget for current budget was uh, thirty three thousand that Don had, and it was since we've got these others coming up in the next couple of years, why don't we just put together the project to address all three? Uh, we can let it as three individual roofs or lump it together depending on how bids come in. Um, we sent plans out to four contract roofing contractors uh, and then required a project site meeting so the contractors saw what the actual conditions are, knew what they were getting into. There's no questions or if they have questions, we can get them addressed ahead of time. Uh, quotes were received from one contractor on April 27th, uh, that contractor being Brockway Mechanical here in town. They provided individual uh, quotes for each roof and then uh, quote for damage to insulation because the roofs are being replaced for a reason. Uh, leaks occur, damaging insulation, that needs to be replaced. However, until you get the roof taken off, you don't know exactly what it is, so we ask for a square foot price. Uh, additionally, Brockway provided an alternate quoted price if all three roofs were to be replaced of $59,900. Uh, following the receipt of this quote, uh, I communicated with Don and Stephanie as far as what the budget considerations were on which route they felt they wanted to take. Um, through that communication back and forth, we determined that the replacement of all three roofs uh, should be done. It provides a savings of 4000 nearly $5,000, I believe, uh, if it's done all three roofs now instead of spanning it out over the next couple fiscal years. Um, did did we have a, we don't have a we don't have a hard number on uh, insulation, do we? No, there is no hard number on insulation. You don't have um, a do you got a, a medium medium hard <laughs> medium boiled egg hard number? I until that roof gets taken off, you can't really know what's there. Uh, I do know that there's you have a nice gap in one roof that's been patched before. Um, I would guess probably at a minimum you'd be looking around 200 square feet. I mean a 10 by 20 stretch, something like that. Unless Don has some better guidance on an expectation. Just from my information, since I don't know the difference between a ballasted and unballasted roof, what does that mean? Uh, the ballasted roof is a Basically, a rubber sheet is put down, and then river rock aggregates placed on the top of it. River rocks placed on the top of it to hold it in place. Uh, the EPDM roof, they'll remove that ballasted. Uh, the EPDM's either glued down or anchored down. Um, it doesn't have the rock on the top holding it in place. So what do you think of that, Jim? I learned something. Good. That's good. 
You guys good? Yep. Yes. Okay. Seems like we just keep spending money for Don. <laughs> Almost every week, Don has something here to spend money for. He's always smiling, He's too. Yeah. <laughs> He's always smiling. All right. Uh, come on down, Chief. We have resolution approving fire department fees for American Heart Association classes. All right, we've, we've had fees for a long time for CPR, basic CPR. We've t we teach those, you know, twice a month uh, ever since I've been on the fire department. But we've had a couple requests to do, add these other classes, uh, advanced cardiac life support and pediatric advanced life support. And they're fairly long, especially the initial class. It's an eight-hour class. So for us to tell people to come in, oh, yeah, we can teach you, that's quite a commitment. Uh, we've, get, we've trained two people in the last two years to teach both of those classes, so we have to have them come in off-duty to teach the class, so there's an expense to the fire department. Normally, for a regular CPR class, all we're getting back is the cost of the card. This is what we pay American Heart to get the card, so. And we encourage people to take CPR, so we want, we'll teach anybody that wants to learn CPR, we'll do that. These classes are a little more advanced. They're for paramedic, paramedic level classes, so. We couldn't very well pay somebody to come in on overtime for an eight-hour shift and then not then charge somebody $25 for a card. Mm -hmm. That's So we're not making money, but we're not, we felt we didn't want to lose money, but we want to offer the service if people want to come. So if you find other rates for maybe the University of Iowa or something for these two classes, they're probably a little bit more because they're trying to, they're running a business trying to make money off these classes. We really just want to be able to, you know, have somebody from Superior or one of the other ambulance services around here, if they need the class, then, then we'll offer it. And a lot of times if one of our guys needs the refresher or the renewal at the same time, we, we put them in the same class, so it can do dual, mm -hmm. dual purpose, so. Pretty, pretty straightforward. I, I don't know that we ever had a resolution for the CPR classes. I, that was way before my time that we, we had those, but. Good stuff, good, good right. stuff. Hey, you know what? I don't think I've ever seen you without your haircut. Is that Mama standing on really? top of that, or is that you? That's Mama on this one. I kind of this figured. one was. Yeah. yeah, I kind of figured it's Mama every time. Yeah. Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> um, we have some uh, public hearings set for June sixth. First is a consideration of voluntary severance of territory located north of Florence Avenue. What's that? There's a Property, uh, leave off Irish Ridge that you have to access through county property to get to it. There's a large drainage area there. It's a triangular shape piece, but we'll have more information at the next meeting. Okay. And then the other one is a consideration of a permanent encroachment agreement with the Art Guild of Burlington, Inc. for encroachment into right of way at 301 Jefferson Street, Burlington, Iowa. I think uh, everybody knows. You got anything you want to say? Okay. All right, then. Um, the annual fire report. So I took this annual report from the booklet form and made it into a PowerPoint for tonight. So it may not follow exactly long, it's in chronological order, but. <clears throat> All right. So that's our mission statement. It's on the front page. I'm gonna go right into our, I need to remember to, to click myself ahead while I'm talking. I said, there's, that's what the Burlington Fire Department looked like on January 1st of 2016. So right after the, the first of the year, that's our organization chart. A little bit different than what it was last year. Um, a couple new officers, a new battalion chief, a new deputy chief, uh, two new lieutenants from last year. Uh, we had a vacancy when we started the new year. Somebody had resigned back in December. Uh, we've since filled that position in uh, March. So we're back up to... Uh, 42 that people assigned to shifts, or 41 people assigned to shifts. 
uh, 44 altogether. However, starting July or June, in June, two people are leaving the fire department, one for medical school. Uh, he graduates this weekend, matter of fact, from college. And then the other one's retiring June 1st. So those two bottom positions will, will no longer be on there. We'll be at uh, 13 people per shift, uh, total staffing of 42 county administration. I was just going to mention, we filled the vacancy with a, a veteran firefighter out of Fort Madison, a firefighter paramedic. He has uh, 10 or 11 years on the job, so we got a really good uh, new hire, somebody that, that came in. Uh, we only had a couple weeks of recruit training, and he put him right to work. So Man, that's a good break. It's turned out really good. That Yeah, that doesn't usually happen. I'm just moving into the areas that we, we cover, fire prevention is one of the big ones. Uh, something that we were able to do this year is update our pre-plans. And we moved to an online format. So when we go out to a, a commercial building, uh, all the vehicles will command vehicle and the two first out engines and the ambulances have iPads now. Uh, they can get on there and they can click a pre-plan for the buildings that we've done. And it's on the GIS website. So if you know Austin uh, from GIS that works in the county. Uh, he's been very helpful in, in us getting that going along with Battalion Chief McGee and uh, Firefighter Skiffstad. So it's really neat when we, we show up to say, I'm trying to think of some that we've done. Uh, Sunnybrook Assisted Living Center. Uh, we show up there, you can click on the pre-plan, you can see where all the exits are. There's some things with the uh, sprinkler system there and the, uh, that's different than a lot of other places. So it's nice to be able to bring that up to remind yourself, hey, that is nice. this is what's going on here. Here's all the contact information. It's all online. Before everything was paper, uh, in the back of our command car, there's a couple files that are still in there, just crammed full of papers. But the problem is that they don't ever get updated when they're on paper because you got to totally recreate the whole document to change. Uh, usually, it's the owner information, phone numbers, that kind of thing. So uh, we got those, uh, got that going. That was one of our goals that we had had from 2014. Um, the other one was uh, completed all required inspections. Um, Mark found 465 fire code violations last year. Oh. Uh, that was another one of our goals that we had uh, to make sure that we got all the required inspections done. Is that normal? A normal number? Yeah. Well, some years there's more inspections. Like we instituted the hotel motel inspections. Well, that's every other year. So like this coming year, there'll actually be more required inspections. Uh -huh. So. Uh, we installed 690 smoke alarms last year. We did that big community-wide event, a one-day event with the uh, Red Cross, the Elks, and others that helped us with that. Fire Marshal Crook spent 80 hours on 39 structure fires. And what, what that means is on the actual scene, so he averages about two hours on the fire scene itself. So I just go through my head, that's about two weeks worth of time he's on a fire scene. but. That's just a drop in the bucket to what he does afterwards. He's working with the state fire marshal's office, the Burlington Police Department, insurance companies following up on these fires, doing a lot of investigation, which we haven't figured out a way to, to track that because it's working on this fire, working on this fire. So it, it, he does spend a lot of time doing investigations. And then some of the other things that uh, it's hard to put a number on as the plan reviews, but anytime there's a new building and a remodel, reconstruction, addition, uh, Mark's got to go over the plans, looking at the sprinkler and fire alarm systems, and then he goes out there and performs a test on those as well. Uh, we did a lot of public education events. Whenever we're out in the public, we try to make it an education event, whether we're in a school or with a neighborhood association or presenting to the numerous, uh, you know, the Rotary Club. Uh, Lions Club, anything like that. We try to, to present a, a fire prevention uh, message with that. Moving on that to our operations last year. Um, one of our goals was to review and update all of our internal policies. And I, I can't take very much credit for that. That was the new deputy chief, uh, Deputy Chief Ryan. He's totally updated, revamped all of our internal policies, got them in an organized fashion. Uh, has them set up for annual reviews, which is great. So none of our policies should get out of date, in it, which they do really easy when you have promotions or change of vehicle stuff uh, needs to be updated. So he's taking care of that. Oh, we did promotional exams. I kind of already mentioned that we uh, did all that internally. Uh, we hired a deputy chief, battalion chief, and two lieutenants. Uh, that was another one of our goals. 
And then we applied for and received uh, numerous grants. Uh, we received an assistance to firefighters grant for 22,000 that we used for vehicle extrication equipment. Uh, ADM gave us 3,400 toward those iPads for the pre-planning that we put in the, the vehicles. Um, Homeland Security, thanks a lot to Gina Harden, uh, Des Moines County Emergency Management. She, thanks, Gina. she just asked us, hey, is there anything, you know, we say, yeah, we could use thermal imagers. And she writes the grant, she submits them, she pays for it, we just tell her and then we get the stuff. So it works out really good for us. So we job. got we got thermal imagers, uh, a lot of some other hazmat metering equipment, and then we've had several classes. As a matter of fact, we've got another one tomorrow that she she's funding. They're they're very expensive. One day class just to bring the instructor here is five thousand dollars for an eight hour class. So we normally that would that's half our fire training budget. We wouldn't do that on our own, but uh, she gets a grant and that works out great. Uh, the big thing last summer was the bird flu response, and I've been to two conferences since then, and they bring that up, and they actually talk about the Burlington Fire Department. We had six members of our hazmat team go, and they you think that's... You guys represented for the bird yes, flu. Yes, we were the largest, any single hazmat team, we had the most people that responded, and there was much larger cities involved than, than Burlington, so it was a great experience for our guys to go. Um, we established an engine and ambulance uh, committees last year. You know, we've ordered the, the new engine, can't get here soon enough, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. Hopefully next week, Thursday, we're going up there to do the final inspection. They fix anything that's wrong overnight and then we bring it back on Friday, so. Good. Yeah. Let's see. The next thing on there is we did a countywide renumbering of fire and EMS vehicles. That's something that's been talked about in Des Moines County responders oh, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. We want to renumber our vehicles. We want to have the numbers mean something. But we're just, we can never agree on who's going to get what set of numbers and what the numbers are going to mean. And actually, that's another thing. Deputy Chief uh, Donnie Ryan got that going again. And he's the vice president of the Des Moines County uh, Firefighters Association. He brought it up through there. He developed the numbers. He sent them out, got them approved. And now every fire department and every ambulance service was us, Superior, and Mediapolis now have standardized numbering systems. So if you don't listen to a scanner, you probably wouldn't notice, but a lot of people are like, what do these numbers mean? Because we're not saying engine or truck or command, we're saying just a number. So if you hear 701, you know, 700s is the Burlington Fire Department, any number in the 700s. So 701 is the chief, so I'm 701. Uh, West Burlington is the 500, so 501 is the chief. 520, anything in the 520s would be an engine. So when somebody comes, you know what they're, what kind of vehicle they're bringing with them. So it's been quite an achievement to get the whole county on board with that. And I'm sure Donnie wouldn't take all the credit for that. He just facilitated. Everybody did have to agree to change their number. So uh, we taught, or we sent uh, 276 12 lead EKGs to the hospital. We would do more. However, only two of our E EKG monitors are currently capable of that. I think that's in the next fiscal year's budget to buy three more EKG uh, 12 lead monitors we'll be able to send from every unit. So there are some calls that we go out on, they would like to send a 12 lead to, directly to the hospital, but they can't do that. They can take it, they can read it, they can call it into the hospital, but they can't send it directly for the doctor to look at. So uh, the best, the, the thing about that is if they're having an MI, a heart attack, and you send that into the hospital and they read it and they confirm it, they'll, they'll get the, you'll just skip the ER and go right into the cath lab with the patient, which is, you're trying to reduce that time from when we pick them up to when they're in the cath lab, getting their stents put in or bypass or whatever they need. So I just, that eliminates some of that time. Oh, uh, we taught 42 CPR classes. Again, we do at least two per month. So that's 24 right there. Then a lot of the other ones are on request. If somebody calls and says, hey, I need a, like a daycare center or something, we'll have a lot of staff that needs CPR certified, then we'll set them up for a day just for them. So we do a lot of that. Uh, I listed in here all the members that are on boards and committees. And that's one thing I've encouraged, especially our officers to do, is to get involved with Des Moines County EMS, Des Moines County Fire, uh, Mavis, uh, Henderson County uh, EMS and Fire. There's a lot of different organizations that we should, as the largest fire department in the community around the area, we should be involved in all these different committees. So we've actually, I'm not saying we're taking over, but we've, we're now in leadership positions on a lot of those boards, presidents, vice presidents, treasurers. We're taking that over. Kind of, yeah, that's, a, some people might say that. But so we, 
I'm not going to go through all those, but we're, we're involved in, if there's something fire EMS related, we're, we're involved in the committee. The next thing is training. That's outside of actually running our calls. That's probably the, the, the next important, most important thing that we do. Um, last year, just a, a total of hours that's recorded. I know there's hours that people aren't putting into the training software so it doesn't get recorded, but we had 7,008 hours of training, so about 160 hours on average per person, which sounds like a lot, but it's really not meeting the standard. Really? The standard for fire training is 192 hours of fire training. Then the drivers need an additional, everyone down here, drivers need an additional 12 hours, and then our paramedics, for a two-year cycle, they need 60 hours, so about 30 hours per year. So you're looking upwards of 250 hours per year of training to keep up with the uh, what's what's required? I say what's required. It's the standard. We're we're you know, EMS. Yes, you have to meet the standard, or you lose your certification. On the fire side, there's no certification. But when you get inspected by ISO, they're going to look and say, how much training are you doing? So we're trying to meet the ISO standard, uh, also the NFPA standard. <clears throat> the next thing there is the ARF simulator. That's the airport or aircraft rescue and firefighting. Um, Two years ago, I met with the airport board on several occasions about keeping our people certified to, to cover the airport, and they thought that was very important. They're, they are paying uh, the department, I believe, 9000 a year for airport coverage, so their aircraft aren't actually large enough to require certification, but they want us to be certified in case they would ever get that, that back for the airport. So we used to send people up to Dubuque or Cedar Rapids or somewhere, and it was really costly to do that. And this is still costly, but we bring it here Last year we were able to do it on two shifts, uh, so those guys and then plus anybody that was wanted to come in off duty could take the certification class with the the instructor. So we're doing that we're doing that every year. It's an annual certification that you have to to go through. Um, live fire training at SCC last year, which was really good. Eric, I lost my. We work a lot with SCC. We're on the EMS and fire boards. So we do a lot of training with them. If their students need something, which was the live fire training, they just call us up and say, hey, we have the instructors, we have the props. Can you guys just come out and train with our students? And we're like, yeah, this is great. So we just send guys as they can go out and uh, train. And I'm, I keep saying guys, we do have a gal. I apologize. So guys, guys and She's and tough, too. People, personnel. People. Very good. <clears throat> Uh, three people last year went to the National Fire Academy in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Uh, myself and two other officers were able to go out there for different classes. And then we've continued to do the NFPA 1410 drills, which are the go out on the street and uh, there's requirements as far as hooking to a hydrant, how far much hose you have to lay out, getting the hose off the truck, setting the ladder up. There's different, there's about 13 different drills. Uh, the guy that's doing our fire training, he sets that up every month, sends out a okay, this is the drill for the month. They start practicing the drill, and sometimes they complain, like, you can't make this. This is too, too short of a time period, but they usually figure it out by the end of the month, okay, we can meet the time by doing something a little different. So uh, then what happens at the end of the month, the deputy chief goes out with them, and then he, he uh, evaluates their performance, makes sure they meet the, the time requirement. So I think the guys really enjoy doing that. It's out, it's out there doing stuff. The, You've got good numbers. The problem is, is when it's really hot. I know that gets to be a really good numbers on. On our, uh, I, I've jumped ahead. Oh, you jumped ahead. Okay, I'll I'll jump ahead to the next one. I stole this from the uh, police department. So, thank you, Chief Beard. So I, those are our, <laughs> these are our numbers if they come up here, but they, I stole the graph from the police department report. I thought that was pretty interesting and I'm afraid to click it again. Should it's, I click it again? No, it's here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I just thought it was interesting. Deputy Chief Ryan, he, he made this for me. So our average number of years of service is 13.2. And you can see actually there's nobody with 13 years on, but that's the average somehow. There's a span of years there we must not have had any hiring or people had left. But we do have a lot of people with 12, 12 years or less on the job. And you can see we had that spike when we had the, the SAFER grant a couple years ago. So a lot of people, eight people have two years on the job and then a couple, one has less than that. Is 
unusual to have a firefighter on for 35 years? Yes. That would be Jeff Warner, and he started when he was, I think, 18 or 19 years old, which is very hard now. If we're hiring paramedics, it's just you don't get out of school, go to paramedic class, and get on when you're 19. Now, we've had, I think, Andy Crooks may have been 20, but he's the exception to the rule. Uh, one of them, the next one there, the 33-year, that's Daryl Bailey, and he is retiring. He's the one that retires June 1st. Okay. <laughs> and I'll just, I'll just keep moving along here. Uh, fire department call statistics: the t 2015 4,800 or 4,585 calls, and I just want to make a note: those are emergency calls. We don't count going out to put in smoke detectors, going to the schools to do public education. Those are only either 911 calls where we have to go right away, or a hospital calling for a transfer or something like. They are actual, actual calls. Uh, 2014, we had uh, 4,201. Uh, just did a little comparison there on the the difference. A lot of them were EMS. We had a lot, quite a few more EMS calls last year. Hmm. So you got three to four special calls. Always going to have a yeah. few of those, huh? Yeah, but I'm not sure. I didn't look them up to see what they were exactly. <laughs> but, uh, the, but the next one, and I mentioned in the very the opening page, where, and I had the little uh, letter to the city council. Uh, but I went back to 1997, basically because that's the year I started the job, and that's also the year that I could go back and find the, a good report of our calls. So hmm. I need to go one ahead, Eric. You want me to do it? I got it. Okay. So in 1997, we, we had 2,594 calls. So we're, we're up about 75% over where we were back then. We had 49 people on the fire department. Today we have 44, soon to be 42. Uh, to kind of see the difference in the calls there, where we're at, looks like about 1,600 of the, the difference is EMS calls. And I'll, and I'll talk about that on the next slide here, why that is. So why the big increase? Well, population and geographic areas covered by the Burlington Fire Department has grown. So obviously we added in the quad townships for fire coverage a few years ago. Uh, we've taken on Illinois, Gulfport as far as 911, then we've all of Henderson County for tiering for ambulance. Um, we've had increased calls for mutual aid. Uh, I'll show you in a little bit on a graph. We had 40 calls where we went somewhere else last year for mutual aid, either over into Illinois for a fire call, not, not counting EMS, just for fire. Went to West Burlington, went to Danville, Minneapolis, Weaver. We go all over for mutual aid, but we added 40 calls. You go back to 2004, I think there was one or two calls from mutual aid. We just didn't get called outside the city limits. Um, so that's one reason. It's only, only 40 the calls difference. Uh, here's the biggest reason. Population groups that use public services are growing. Uh, so the elderly population, 65 and over, that group of people, and also residents living in poverty. There are two groups that use public services a lot. So from 2000 to 2014, you can see our population over 65 went from about 17% to over 26% of our population, especially EMS-wise. That makes a huge difference, and I don't. And that's that population is projected to keep growing in the near future. Uh, residents living in poverty that that number jumped a lot too, but 6% from 2000 to 2014. And these these numbers are all you could go to the U.S. Census Department, and that's that's where I took the numbers from. I used 52601 as a whole, so you get actually get some of the, the county addresses in there as well. Um, but generally, uh, that's, that's a pretty fair uh, picture of what, of what we have. So with that said, you know, I don't know that any one of those two groups is going to go down a whole lot in the near future, so I would say our calls are going to continue to be to go up. I'll just have a few uh, graphs here. Mutual aid departments, this is either received, so these are calls where we asked for mutual aid or calls where we uh, responded for mutual aid. So all, all told there was uh, 90. 50 times we asked for mutual aid, 40 times we went out and gave some another department mutual aid. So obviously West Burlington is the biggest participant in mutual aid. Gladstone, a lot of those would be uh, car accidents. There are a few maybe brush fires in there, but a lot of times we'll get called over there to do extrication or something on a car accident. 
inspections by type for 2015. I, I totally skipped over one page, didn't I? Inspections by type for 2015. I did those by percent. Uh, liquor license is the biggest inspection that, that Mark goes out and performs. So all the bars, anywhere that sells alcohol has to have a, an annual liquor inspection. Uh, daycares permit required are a lot of uh, automotive places or places that are doing uh, painting. If they're doing spraying, dipping, that kind of thing, they're required to have a permit. Uh, those are also a lot of his uh, inspections. And then the violations, 17 times he has to go back out and reinspect. Those are ones that he doesn't charge for. You know, you go there and you say, you know, your smoke detector doesn't have a battery or whatever. They fix it, he comes back, verifies it, uh, it's done. The second and third are the ones where, you know, I told you once, I came out, I checked, you still didn't fix it, and I have to go back. And we actually do have a fee for those inspections uh, built in. If I could, I'm afraid to go back, but if I, can you click me back to the response areas in 2015? All right. So I just wanted to show that to say, you know, our calls, only 72% of our calls are actually in the city of Burlington, whether it's fire or EMS. The other 28% of the time, we're going somewhere else. Uh, West Burlington, again, is the biggest area. The rural townships, Danville, and other would be most all of that is Illinois. Some of that, there's a couple calls maybe to Minneapolis or uh, down south of town to uh, Weaver or Denmark, but th those are not very often. And we've already we talked about this in the uh, the budget, but I just thought that was a quite an increase from the year before. So I included that our Emilt's billing, what we billed that year and brought in that year, was uh, just over one million. And then there's some other past due payments that came in the, on the bad debt recovery, sixty six thousand, and then the CTAA paid us sixty one thousand per their contract. Oh, it's clicking right through now. NFPA 1710 report, that's the standard that we go by as far as how many people should be at a structure fire, how fast you should get there. Uh, it talks about EMS calls and what kind of people and how, how soon they should be there as well. So turnout time is the time it takes us from when dispatch rings our bell to when we're in the vehicle going en route. So the standard for a fire is 80 seconds. Um, we're averaging about 91 seconds. And Part of that is if it's at night, it takes a little bit longer for the people to get down there and get dressed and get on the truck. That's they're putting on their turnout gear for that time. Don't, I mean, um, it, for for the size that we've got and the area that we cover, uh, don't you think that's, that's well? That turnout time doesn't have anything to do with distance. All that distance from your from the kitchen okay, well, to the truck. That's okay, all that's okay, measuring. Okay. Yeah. So that is one thing downtown, especially it's such a big station. You know, getting from where you're at getting into the proper gear and getting out the door. Um, that's a pretty good time. I can't figure out how to make the data show the percentage of time that we're under 80 seconds for this particular piece here. Uh, first due engine company, so the first uh, group that's on scene needs to be there in five minutes or less, including the turnout time. So take the 91 seconds and then the drive time, you should be there in five minutes or less. We're doing that 45% of the time. And a lot of that is there are areas in town we just can't get there. I mean, there's just no possible way. Anything, a lot of it off of Sunnyside or out in Lenox Park, uh, those, those places just aren't, just can't do it. Uh, the remainder of the first alarm should be there in nine minutes or less. Uh, that would be the second station. Uh, also would include West Burlington on automatic aid. So 74% of the time we get the second station there. They're not that far apart within the nine minutes. So we're doing it 74% of the time. Uh, total number on the scene. Uh, it depends on what kind of, <clears throat> for a regular house fire, you're talking, you need about, you need 15 people per NFPA on scene. If you're doing high rises, then you need 17 or 18. Uh, but going with the 15 people on scene, we're averaging 11, so we're not meeting that all the time. Part of that is we've got other calls going on where we just don't have the people to come to the scene. Um, we call people in off duty, but a lot of times they, by the time they get there, we've got, pretty much the situation under control and they're going to the stations to, to man a, a second out ambulance or a, a fire truck in case we get another call which happens a lot when we're out on a fire scene. Uh, ambulance arrival time again uh, five minutes or less. Um, we're averaging five minutes and 30 seconds so we're just barely over that and that it also includes the uh, turnout time. 
One caveat on that is that's emergency and non-emergency ambulance call. Since we started doing EMD at dispatch, we do get what's called priority two call. So they call us out to an address and we don't go there with lights and sirens on. So that does take you a little longer. We still go, you know, we still go out of the building just as fast. They still drop whatever they're doing, go down and get in the ambulance and go to the call, but they just don't use the lights and sirens. So uh, we get quite a few of those a day and those do affect your overall time. I'm hoping with a new software system we're using, we can divide out the non-emergency call so we get a better idea what our time actually is. <clears throat> All right, moving on to uh, challenges before I finish this off, but uh, I've already talked about increased calls with fewer personnel. So really how that affects us is our training. Uh, we have less time for training and it's very rare that you would hold the class and not be interrupted. So pretty much any time you hold a class, you either got to hold the class twice so you can maybe do half the shift now and half the shift later, or the ambulance crews are, are in and out a lot. So they, they miss out on a lot of training. Um, increased overtime. Uh, with that, a lot of that has to do with, uh, kind of goes on, later on down there we'll talk about greater stress on crews, but obviously the more calls you go on, it's not just the one call where you lift somebody really heavy, it's the lifting the cot over and over and over again, eventually gets to you and we do have, uh, get quite a few injuries from that. Uh, more reliance on mutual aid, I already talked about that. We, we do way more mutual aid for and given than we've ever done in our history. Uh, greater likelihood of simultaneous calls and pretty much all our calls at a minimum, the calls I'm reporting, it takes two people. There's no call that takes less than two. So an EMS call at the minimum, you're talking two, sometimes four, sometimes five. Uh, the fire calls, you know, if it's an actual fire other than a car fire, it's taking all the personnel that are on duty. Um, greater stress on crews physically and mentally. Obviously, the, you know, the more calls you get, the, the more kind of stuff you're seeing, uh, the more wear and tear on your body uh, that they're facing. A uh, lack of rest. I know there's this, sometimes there's this perception that, oh, they're just, everybody's taking a nap. Well, I can tell you, they are not taking naps. But they do need they do need rest. They do need downtime during the day to recover from the calls, and there's not a lot of that happening. Uh, greater wear and tear on equipment, especially our engines. Our ambulances were on a good rotation schedule. We're, we're doing pretty good, but the engines. Hopefully, we get this one next week, and then I think it's three years out we get our next one. But um, had one breakdown again today. It's about a 20 year old engine. It's real. It's ready for a back row and not to be run out of the station every day. But we just have anything to replace it with at the minute. A lack of a ded dedicated EMS coordinator and EMS officer. Uh, back in 2010, we had we had two deputy chiefs, and we had decided one was going to be dedicated <laughs> solely to EMS uh, duties. However, that that's when we lost the deputy chief, so that never actually happened. Um, but what we do now, we have a battalion chief that kind of oversees the training of EMS. However, he's He's also running his own shift, so he is overwhelmed with EMS, and we've kind of divided it out to where myself, the deputy chief, uh, Dana, we've all kind of taken on some of these duty, whether it's continuous uh, quality improvement or audits. Uh, something I, Donnie and I started doing a couple months ago is we read all the EMS reports that need read, go through, give the guys feedback on their treatment, on their reports. Um, training, it's really hard for the battalion chief is Eric Bollinger to, to line up all the training because he works a 24 hour shift so he doesn't see the other two shifts. So he's always trying to coordinate, find instructors on the other shifts. Uh, we need to have a HIPAA compliance officer supply, required skills maintenance, require somebody to oversee that. Certification tracking. Iowa is okay, Illinois is a nightmare keeping track of our certifications. All of our people are dual certified Iowa and Illinois. Um, Kind of talk about inconsistencies with training. We don't have a an instructor. You know, before we had the one deputy chief that that's kind of what he did. He taught the same class three shifts in a row. Well, now we don't have that where different people are having to teach the classes. Uh, same with difficulty lining up instructors. Uh, lack of a consistent EMS contact for outside agencies. So we get called to put on a class or if somebody has a question about something with EMS. We try to give it to Battalion Chief Bollinger. However, like I said, he works a 24-hour shift. so. He's only there about every third day. Um, and difficulty keeping up, keeping up on advances uh, in technology and skills without somebody dedicated to being the EMS person.
And here's something that's been on our radar for ISO or NFPA, you need to do so many hours of live fire training and fire training in a fire training facility of some kind, about 12 hours a year, day and night training. Well, the only facility nearby is down in Fort Madison, which for us, you can't do that on duty. You'd have to pay people overtime to come in and go down there. West Burlington has got to start out by the hospital. They've built a small pad where they have a training prop, but they don't have a facility. They don't have a, a tower or anything to do live, live fire training. So uh, that's something that for, for ISO and for internal training that we really need to, to look at. So looking ahead to 2016, uh, we're like halfway through the year. So some of the stuff we're already working on, but we just implemented this last week and that's a change in our EMS software and hardware. We're using the iPads for EMS reporting. Um, it's a huge adjustment for our crews and it's something I've been working on and Donnie and Mark, we're all trying to get this going, but uh, we changed as of May 1st to a new, new software for EMS. Um, still working on it. I continue to look for ways to improve our ISO score. So whether it's an equipment, uh, training, making sure the training that we do is recorded, that's a big thing because we, we do training that sometimes doesn't get recorded. So I'm big on keeping it recorded. Our, in our new engine, we made sure it was uh, built to NFPA, I can't remember what it is, 19, 1901 standard. Uh, there were some things that they sent us back a, a record and say, okay, these are the ways it's not going to meet 1901 and it's up to you to do it, like put the ladders on it, the hose. Uh, SCBA. Some of the equipment we're just taking from our old engine, putting on the new one. But other than that, it's built to, to meet the standard. Uh, we're going to continue to apply for grants. We just wrote uh, the SAFER grant. Uh, two different AFG grants are in. Uh, look for those wherever we can. Explore and utilize new technologies. Uh, again, using the iPads, a lot of things are moving to the moving to web-based, which is great internally where you know stuff updates software updates uh, we don't have to rely so much on city IT staff to come and every time there's a new update for something I have to have them come down update each computer yeah. it's all up out what do you call out in the cloud or whatever so our EMS fire billing all that now is is in the is in the cloud so it just updates itself automatically which has been awesome uh, continue to advance our training program uh, finalize recruit training process so we were lucky with the last new person. Like I said, he was a veteran. He didn't take a whole lot of training, but we've been ha we have a year-long probationary process where we work them through a book. Uh, the person we hired just before Jared, our last one, we we brought him in and we did a 40-hour training. Or uh, take that back, four weeks of 40-hour weeks. So we brought him in for about a month and try to get most of his probationary training done. So then we had the rest of the time to evaluate this person to make sure they were up to snuff so we're, we're working on that trying to get that finalized so from now on when we hire a new person this is your recruit right. training this is how it's set up you come in you work either two weeks for an experienced person or or four for somebody that's that's fresh so and again that, a lot of these aren't new this is the stuff we, we always do but focus on prevention and that prevention is so hard to measure I mean you don't know what you prevented whether it's through education or uh, updating the the building codes you think maybe you might have prevented a fire, but you really don't know. Sometimes with a smoke detector, somebody might call and say, hey, you know, it went off when I was burning food on the stove or whatever. But normally, you, a lot of the prevention stuff you don't know. But we're always looking into that. Um, continue with the public education, smoke alarm installations, uh, anything that we can do to help out. I think that's the end of it. Anybody got any questions? I don't have any questions. I just want to say, uh, uh, I sure appreciate the job you guys are doing, and uh, um, you, know, you know how I feel about you, man. I, I, I pat you on the back every time I get a chance. I think we got a great uh, uh, fire chief, and uh, we got a good we got a good staff down there. So hopefully, uh, you know, we can we'll, as we move forward down the road that we'll be able to uh, uh, help you with some of those problems that yeah. that, that are going to be uh, facing you guys in the future. So, but good job. I, I, I really have to say that I really, I, 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 th I think we're really, really blessed to have the, the fire yeah. department that we have. Thank you. I kind of read through there and I thought I kind of ended on a bummer there, but I don't want it to seem that way because I think things well, are no, moving in the right direction. I got a great, I mean, I can't be more happy with my administrative staff and the, the people that we've been hiring. Just everybody in general has been really good to work with and I think we're making a lot of progress. So 
always room for improvement. I mean, that's never going to end. We could, right. You could give us all the money in the world, and we would still there'd be something that we needed to work on. Right. That's just how that is. So, good job. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Chief. Uh, does anybody have any issue with the appointment, uh, Phoebe Herrig, for uh, uh, lower end housing? Anybody have an issue with that? Okay. Good. Um, I brought back, I brought everybody back something from my trip. Uh, Mr. Teslin, do you have anything you want to say before we, would you like to show everybody your gift? I brought you back something special. Some peanuts. The peanuts uh, from the flight. The, yeah. the bridge, bridge runs this Saturday at 8. I encourage everyone, anyone to sign up that wants to, can be a fun run walk, the 5K or more competitive run, 5 and 10K. So I encourage people to sign up for it while they still can. Eat those peanuts before you run and you'll win. <laughs> Council, you Councilwoman. Um, let's see, this Saturday is a fundraiser at Rotors for um, the Special Olympics. I just encourage everyone to come out. What are you gonna be doing there? I will get pied in the face. Oh, Should be a good time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so stop on out and make an appearance. That's it. Thank you. Councilman? Nothing tonight. Okay. Um, I just want to, uh, just briefly, want, want to thank uh, 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 the city of Atlanta, uh, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, Natchez, Mississippi. They were just uh, fantastic, especially Mississippi. They were wonderful hosts. Uh, we got a chance to travel down for the, uh, to, uh, to receive our, the award. Uh, for the area, it was uh, just a fantastic trip, and uh, I, I could I could sit here for uh, 45 minutes to an hour telling you about all the fantastic things that that uh, we got to experience that happened on the trip, um, but I won't do that so that nobody gets mad at me. But feel free to talk to Dave Toyer or to Jason Hutchison or to uh, uh, to Hans as well, um, Trousel, and uh, but it was just a fantastic trip. So uh, glad we got a chance to do that. Also. Uh, just, um, we were there at the day of prayer, uh, 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 myself and the mayor pro tem were there to, uh, to support that and that I thought uh, turned out really well and uh, um, I just want to say thank you, you're always available for stuff like that, uh, it goes without saying. And, and then also I just want to thank uh, John Billups uh, for the invitation. Um, he had to go through the entire phone book till he got to the M's, <laughs> God bless him. And, uh, but uh, I got a chance to, to speak for the, uh, for the teacher of the year, and uh, it was a great, it was a fantastic program. A lot of teachers that I, that I recognize and remember from school, and uh, uh, it, it was just a fantastic event. So it was good to be a part of that as well. Um, and I just want to say I'm just excited. We, uh, we're moving forward. People say, you know, I, I've heard this so many times. You know, Burlington never gets anything done. You know, they start stuff, they don't finish it. Or they're not going to, you know, they're not going to make a commitment to do anything. They've been kicking this down the road. Well, you know, we're not kicking the can anymore. And, and I'm, I really feel good about that. We, we, we've, uh, the Burlington Crossing, it's, it's a done deal. They're going to start turning dirt. Uh, the police department, they're getting out of that building that's on a gangster lane. And it, we ought to be ashamed of ourselves. I'm, I'm so grateful for that, that, that we're getting out of there. And that took a lot of hard work. Um, it took uh, the citizens coming together and, and recognizing how important it was. So, uh, I'll, man, I'll, I'll be talking all night, so I'll, get, I'll, be, I'll be done. I'll call it done. And I'm just glad to see, I'm also glad to see uh, Bob made it back from Texas. Uh, we missed him while he was gone. Mayor Pro Tem? I, I guess, um, I think it was about the first council meeting I attended after I got elected. I was sitting right there, and they came in and told us that that people that were going to redevelop that man area had pulled out. And uh, my comment was, don't worry folks, it'll be okay. And so. <laughs> he, did, he didn't lie, <laughs> he didn't lie to you. Eight years later, it's gonna be okay. <laughs> <clears throat> and I have not changed what I've thought since that day. So, there you go. There you go, well said. That's good news. <clears throat> Councilman Fleming. I enjoyed my trip to Houston found some interesting things down there. Some of you have heard this. They don't have <coughs> zoning down there in that huge city. Wow. For instance, I saw a pretty good size area of residential there. 
no sidewalks. Kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well. You know. uh, other than that, uh, we did a lot of driving, but I'm glad to be home. I miss the city council tremendously, but I, I'll get over it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> we know you will. <laughs> I did have a, I should say this, so I did have a citizen come to my house Saturday on this smoke thing from fires in the backyard, you know. And, mm -hmm. and we all know about this. He's talked to the chief, I know, and he's talked to the chief. Yes. And I, I really feel bad for the guy. I mean, he's, I, I, I don't have a solution, you know. The only thing I did think we could look at someday is look at the ordinance. For instance, it says you can have a fire up to 1 a.m. in the morning. Well, maybe that's longer than it should. I don't know. I mean, I'm not into that. But I, under, I hear where you're coming from, though, and I Otherwise, things are looking good in Burlington. I'm very proud of my son, that chamber flyer. He, he wrote a yeah, nice. I thought that, that, that was well done. He's a good kid. He <laughs> takes after his mother. <laughs> <coughs> Mayor is out of order. I move that we adjourn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> after we hear from Steph, you got anything? I don't have anything. Good. I mean, oh. <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. What's that? Oh, uh, who's, who's who's doing KBUR? Who wants to do the radio show? Everybody's dying to spend time with Rob. I have a suggestion. I'll, I'll see okay. you, Rob. Who? Uh, well, you. I wanted to talk about this. Okay. I'll, I'll be there, <laughs> Rob. One other person would be nice. I'll find somebody else. Do you want me to go? That'll be me and Tuan. How about that? Good. What is that? Me Wednesday? And That's right. On Wednesday. At 9 o'clock. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know. Thank I you, work, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> good night. Thanks, folks. I need a sun down there.